A brain aneurysm is a bubble or blister that forms uh, off a vessel in the brain. Um, and the reason we worry about it is that an aneurysm has the possibility of bursting. Um, if it were to, to burst, uh, the consequences are, are very serious. Now, people are born with a defect in the vessel wall that with the passage of time and with the pounding of blood becomes an aneurysm. We usually start to see them when patients are in their 30s or 40s, and they usually start causing problems, namely rupturing when patients are in their 50s, 60s, and recently in the early 70s. Um, aneurysms can occur in any vessel in the, uh, in the body, but the ones that occur in the brain are typically saccular aneurysms. They're also called uh, berry aneurysms but the ones that occur in the rest of the body are fusiform, which are just a uniform dilatation. But that's what an aneurysm is. It's typically very difficult to know whether you have a brain aneurysm unless the aneurysm ruptures. In very rare circumstances, there are aneurysms that grow near a nerve uh, that controls movement of the eyes and uh, patients can develop double vision or they can develop a droopy eye. But that is a very, very rare situation. Um, some patients can have headaches associated with the growth of aneurysms. But again, uh, since so many people have headaches, suffer from headaches, it's very difficult to know uh, that a headache is caused by an aneurysm. And as a matter of fact, it's very rare for that to happen. What turns out is that uh, having an aneurysm is primarily a silent condition. People, people have the aneurysm that grows over time, um, but they don't know that it's there. These days in the United States, since uh, MRIs and CT scans are so widely available, essentially patients are being unofficially screened for aneurysms in the sense that when they report any um, headaches or, the, or any other symptoms that sound related to the brain, uh, it's easy for the doctors to obtain an MRI, MRA, or CT. And, uh, and these patients are found to have the aneurysm incidentally. That means that the aneurysm hasn't caused any symptoms, but then they're found. So essentially, it's, uh, aneurysms are typically silent unless they rupture, um, and, um, and they're found incidentally. If you're diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, uh, typically these days, uh, they're identified by MRI or MRA. Now, MRI, MRA has um, a 60% false positive rate, meaning that when an MRI or MRA indicates that you have an aneurysm, there's a 60% chance that you may not have an aneurysm. So that diagnosis usually has to be confirmed with a CTA, which is a special form of CAT scan. If the CTA confirms that you have an aneurysm, then you should see a neurosurgeon. It's very important to see a neurosurgeon as opposed to a neurologist, because neurosurgeons are the, the specialists that uh, focus their attention on this problem. Now, the neurosurgeon will evaluate the studies, uh, probably the MRI, MRA, and the CTA, and if it's indicated, we'll obtain a catheter angiogram. Now that is, it's an outpatient procedure, it's typically a safe procedure, where uh, patients are given um, a, a bit of sedation, they're sleepy but not completely asleep, and then a, a catheter is put into the femoral artery, and through there, a dye is injected in the brain to find out uh, exactly what the aneurysm looks like and what are the vessels associated with the aneurysm. It's very important to do this study because it's one of the few studies that will give us an idea of what is the thickness of the wall of the aneurysm. So typically if someone is diagnosed with, a, with an aneurysm by MRI, MRA or CTA, then they see a neurosurgeon and then uh, go on to have an angiogram if indicated. At this point, uh, we have um, many options for treating aneurysms. Um, the, the big bifurcation is to whether to treat the aneurysm with open surgery or endovascular techniques. Um, open surgery has an advantage that um, is more permanent, that is the results are uh, more lasting, but it's 
uh, somewhat more invasive. On the other hand, endovascular techniques are easier upfront, but they require a long-term follow-up. So with, uh, with open surgery, that involves uh, doing a craniotomy, and then the aneurysms can be treated by, by clipping, uh, which is putting uh, little clamps at the base of the aneurysm. Um, they can be wrapped, uh, the aneurysm can be trapped, or the patient can undergo a bypass. In terms of endovascular options, at this point, the, the leading endovascular option for the treatment of aneurysms are the flow diversion devices. The pipeline is the, the one that is widely approved, uh, was introduced in, the, in 2007, 2008, 2009, but at this point, um, it's showing much promise. Um, other options are uh, using coils and stents or using coils alone. Coiling uh, was the first successful endovascular treatment for aneurysms, but we have found that it has a very high recurrence rate, and at this point, coiling is being used less and less. So, uh, so basically, um, the, the options for treatment include um, uh, open surgery, endovascular techniques, uh, and always there is a possibility of following the aneurysm. If you're diagnosed with an aneurysm, it's very important to find someone who has tremendous experience uh, with this problem. So um, even though um, uh, neurosurgeons are board certified and that allows them to treat any kind of problem, um, it's very important to find uh, what we call vascular or cerebrovascular neurosurgeons. Um, there, um, uh, uh, there are websites, uh, for example, the Joint Cerebrovascular Section, that, uh, that has a list of uh, people who are members uh, of, that, uh, of that section. And also in every department, uh, there is a cerebrovascular division, and those are, there are members in the cerebrovascular division. Now, being a member of the Joint Section or being part of the cerebrovascular division is not enough. Basically, um, Patients should not hesitate to ask uh, their neurosurgeon uh, or even their offices um, what is their experience with aneurysms. In general, um, in order to select a neurosurgeon specialized in this problem, the neurosurgeon should have treated hundreds of, uh, of aneurysms. So the, it should be in the hundreds. In addition to that, the neurosurgeon should be working in a center of excellence, uh, preferably a hospital that has a stroke center status. Um, and um, in that center, they should be treating uh, at least 200 aneurysm cases a year. That is approximately four cases per week, and that is, in, in our opinion, the minimum required to stay up to date and just keep a, um, a highly efficient uh, system. These days, the outcomes of uh, treatment of aneurysms are outstanding. Um, in, um, in good hands, that is, the hands of a surgeon um, who has treated hundreds of these aneurysms, also working in a center where at least 200 aneurysms are treated um, a year, um, the mortality associated with either open surgery or endovascular surgery for unruptured aneurysms is less than 1%. And the uh, complication rate from the procedures for permanent morbidity is less than 5%. And these are, these are the, uh, the, the standards that, uh, that have to be met in order to treat. Now, this shouldn't be confused with aneurysms that have ruptured. If aneurysms have ruptured and uh, they have caused a hemorrhage, then already the patients come in uh, with many problems. In, in those cases, mortality can be higher, morbidity can be higher, but for unruptured aneurysms, either with endovascular or open surgery, the mortality rate should be less than 1%, and the morbidity, uh, that is other complications, uh, should be less than 5%.